Great, thank you so much. Thanks very much for the invitation and thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about axion-like particles across scales, focusing on their effective field theories and their flavor phenomenology. And uh, everything I'm talking about is based on uh, work with Martin Bauer, Matthias Neubert, Marvin Schnubel, Andrea Tam, and Anna Galder. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, starting off with a sort of broad outline of my talk, I'm going to be taking a top-down approach in a very literal sense, starting from the EFT above the electroweak scale uh, and looking at both the dimension five and the dimension six operators and looking at the running and matching calculations which take us um, to EFTs at different scales uh, and also studying the phenomenological implications of these calculations um, and I'm particularly interested in their flavor implications. Okay, so starting off with why axion-like particles, why do we expect that they, they could be around and they're worth looking for? Uh, well, any dynamics with a spontaneously broken approximate global symmetry is going to produce light spinless particles. So the analogy is the pions of QCD, which end up being lighter than the other QCD resonances, like the protons and the neutrons, um, because they're pseudo Goldstein bosons of an approximate spontaneously broken chiral symmetry in the theory. And likewise, if we imagine that there's some um, new physics sector at some high energy scale, uh, which is out of our current reach, then maybe um, there could be a light spinless particle in the spectrum, um, just because there's some spontaneous um, symmetry breaking in the theory. And um, this could be an axion-like particle, which is assumed to be a CP odd gauge singlet and to have a mass much below um, the scale of the BSM physics. And so if this particle exists and it's much lighter than the scale of other new particles, then it's natural to um, describe its physics in terms of an effective field theory. Uh, and this allows us to study its phenomenology without needing to have an effect, uh, UV completion, uh, without needing to understand all of the details of this, of this physics that's out of our reach. Um, and so uh, up to dimension five, um, uh, this, this is the EFT of the ALP. Um, so, and, this, and this, is, um, this is constructed by assuming two conditions. One is that the ALP is CP odd and its interactions preserve CP. Um, this gives us uh, you know, implications like the, the coupling matri matrices to the fermions are uh, Hermitian and we don't have any terms which are proportional to a square of a field strength. We've only got a field strength, field strength tilde. And um, we also assume that the ALP has a shift symmetry since it's a pseudo Goldstein boson, uh, which is broken only by the ALP mass term. And this um, gives the ALP de derivative interactions with the um, fermions and with the, the Higgs current. So overall we have um, ALP couplings to standard model fields that begin at dimension five, which are suppressed by the ALP decay constant F, um, which is um, assumed to be related to the sort of scale of new physics by a factor of four pi. So overall, we have couplings to the all of the standard model fermions, um, a coupling to a, a Higgs current, and sort of anomaly-like couplings to uh, all of the standard model gauge uh, fields. And then studying the physics of this just amounts to studying the parameter space of this model. So the coupling matrices, the mass, and the, um, and the decay constant. Um, but this uh, EFT, as written, um, has some redundancies uh, because we can do ALP-dependent field redefinitions on the effect of Lagrangian, and it can rot rotate um, some, some of the parameters into, into others. Um, so in particular, if we do the redefinitions that are shown in this black box, so if we, um, if we redefine the standard model um, Higgs and um, uh, fermion fields uh, through this redefinition, which involves the ALP, um, a 
arbitrary coefficient c and some charge under the u1 symmetries of the standard model then the dimension for standard model Lagrangian is unchanged by this um, redefinition. But at dimension five, all the ALP couplings are shifted um, by some amount that's proportional to this C coefficient and these um, charges under the U1 uh, symmetries. And since we've got fly five global um, U1 symmetries of the standard model Lagrangian, we can deduce that there are five redundant parameters. Um, in the um, in the effective Lagrangian as written, and this can be used to eliminate some operators, and in particular, um, the Higgs operator is um, often eliminated, um, and this can be done using a hypercharge transformation, uh, which has this effect on all of the uh, of, on the Higgs coupling and on all of the fermion couplings, and so by choosing the parameter of this rotation, this C, we can remove this operator uh, by rotating it into all of the fermion couplings. Um, and this is, uh, as I said, this is something that is often done and it's something that we will um, use later in the uh, R genes. Okay, so if we have this model um, and we have this um, axion-like particle which is created from this new physics sector, then the scale at which the uh, couplings are naturally defined is at the scale of this new physics. Um, you know, if, if this new theory has some kind of flavor structure or, you know, it has some, some kind of dynamics which ensure that the ALP couples more strongly to, say, gluons than to uh, W bosons, then, then that's the scale at which all of that would happen. Um, but to make the connection to the observables, we need to, you know, we need to run and match to the scale of the measurement uh, to understand the phenomenology at that scale. Uh, so this is what uh, I'm going to be doing over the next few slides. Okay, so the starting point, we're above the electroweak scale. Uh, we need to calculate the renormalization group equations of of these um, coefficients that define the coupling of the ALP to the standard model particles. Um, it turns out that as long as you um, normalize them with, um, with gauge couplings in front, um, the couplings of the ALP to gauge bosons do not uh, renormalize. Um, for the gluon, this goes back to an old non-renormalization theorem by Adler and Bardeen, but it turns out to be true also for the electroweak sector and, and you know, even in the presence of like Higgs loops and things, um, this is zero, at least uh, to two loop. And um, however, the couplings to um, fermions do run, they do get um, uh, contributions to their renormalization group equations, which are given in this black box for the quark um, couplings, but the lepton couplings are highly analogous. Um, so I'm just going to explain a little bit where all of these terms come from. So first, uh, these green these green pieces um, come from Yukawa interactions, so loops involving the Higgs, uh, as shown um, in the green box. And these are particularly important for flavor changing effects um, because, you know, since the Yukawas um, violate quark flavor, uh, if you start off, even if you start off at your high scale with um, flavor conserving interactions, through these loops, you can introduce uh, flavor changing effects. Um, so they're important for that reason. Um, then, um, we also get a one loop divergent contribution, which needs the redundant operator involving the Higgs as a counter term. So to account for the effects of this, we, we need to rotate this back into the basis with the field redefinitions um, I talked about a couple of slides ago. Um, and there's some freedom in this, just because you can take some linear combination of, um, of all of the U1 symmetries of the standard model. And this gives these sort of beta parameters, which are only defined up to some combinations. But it turns out that in any particular amplitude, um, you know, these combinations will, will add up to, to, to one of the concrete, um, uh, concrete numbers. And so, you know, this ambiguity is nothing to worry about. 
Um, but these, um, these pieces that you get in this way are actually, um, they can be quite sizable because they end up being proportional to the um, top Yukawa as long as you have a coupling to tops um, at the high scale. And this can lead, for example, to um, sizable effects, you know, sizable new couplings to electrons um, or to basically any other fermion, um, as, long as, you, as long as you start off with, with a top coupling. Um, which is obviously important for a light alp, um, you know, often the electron channel is an important decay mode. And finally, we have um, contributions from alp gauge interactions, which can um, run into um, alp, alp fermion interactions through these diagrams. And um, the reason there's a two loop diagram here is because, um, you know, given that the, uh, the, the, uh, gauge boson couplings are normalized with a loop factor. Um, depending on the model, these two loop diagrams can be of the same order. Um, but it turns out that the way that they contribute is, is sort of in exactly the same form as the one loop diagram. And so they can be accounted for by just redefining um, these sort of tilde uh, CGG coefficient uh, with, with some trace over the um, over the fermion couplings that 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 enter here, um, and the same for uh, CWW tildes and CBB tildes, they have a, a different kind of trace. Um, okay, so overall we have you know some flavor changing pieces and some pieces which um, enter just you know as a uh, contribution that is proportional to the unit matrix in flavor space, so you can't get any. Um, any new flavor effects from, from this. Okay, so um, that was the RGs of the um, coefficients of the dimension five operators, which mediate the um, interactions of the ALP with the standard model. Um, but of course, this is an effective field theory um, and we expect a, a tower of higher dimensional operators. And uh, so, for the next few slides, I'm going to do a bit of an aside into talking about what happens with these, because um, a lot, you know, most of the operators that you expect at dimension six um, will be Smith-like. They will be constructed out of just standard model fields. And of course, you know, there's a lot of theoretical and experimental effort into constraining the coefficients of such operators um, as, a, as a way of understanding new physics. Um, and so I think it's interesting to understand what the presence of the ALP in the spectrum changes about, about this, this setup, if, we, if we're just focusing on the uh, SMEFT-like operators. Okay, so um, in this ALP effective field theory, there are two ways um, of contributing, uh, of producing contributions to these SMEFT-like operators. The first way is the traditional SMEFT way of just integrating out um, heavy particles at lambda. And, you know, this occurs simply because we have, you know, we, we still have this whole um, BSM sector at lambda, and they are going to produce contributions in this way, exactly as if there were no ALP in the spectrum. But we are also going to get diagrams with two dimension five ALP vertices, which are going to produce a dimension six effect. And um, an example is shown here, a sort of loop diagram with, with an ALP and a Higgs. And these can and generally are uh, divergent. And so these produce um, extra uh, contributions to the renormalization group equations for dimension six operator coefficients. And so schematically, the effect looks like this, um, where this is the um, RGE for some dimension six operator coefficient. And on the right, uh, the first term is the usual anomalous dimension matrix that you get between just dimension six operators, um, you know, which determines how they run and mix into each other. But in the presence of the ALP, we also get this additional term, which is quadratic in the dimension five um, coefficients. 
so uh, in recent work, we calculated all of these additional contributions that you get from um, divergent ALP diagrams. And um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the results of those calculations. I'm just gonna give an overview on this slide. Um, so on the right, all of these tables are all of the dimension six baryon and lepton uh, number conserving um, operators of the standard model effective field theory. And if they are ringed uh, with a dotted line, it means that the ALP, the ALP loops do contribute to their renormalization group equations. And the color that they're ringed with uh, corresponds to this little key on the left um, showing, you know, um, showing the uh, dimension five coefficients that enter that enter into the diagram and that produce the the extra term. So um, there are just two things I want to point out. Firstly, uh, the fact that at least in the water basis, almost no um, operator goes unscathed by the by these ALP effects. Nearly every operator, uh, apart from a handful. Um, are, are ringed here. Um, and another thing I want to point out is that like, you know, there are a few, a few places which are ringed in the same color. You know, you start off from a dimension five um, part of the Lagrangian, which has a smaller number of parameters than the, than the dimension six part. And so the same ALP uh, couplings enter you know, produce effects all over the place here. Uh, and so there's a certain amount of sort of correlations between the effects that you expect to see from a particular uh, ALP coupling. Okay, so what, what can you do with this um, in terms of like looking for new physics um, in these operators? Um, well, I think there's a lot of phenomenology to be done and uh, we haven't done uh, very much of it. I'm just going to show you a couple of kind of back of the envelope style um, applications of, of these calculations. Um, so firstly, it's, uh, it's reasonably well known that axion-like particles can produce um, divergent effects in uh, dipole operators. Um, this is the basis of many of the ALP explanations of the G minus two um, anomaly in the muon magnetic moment, for example. Um, but above the electroweak scale, an example of this is the top chromomagnetic dipole moment, which has been um, constrained at CMS. And by solving these um, ALP RGEs, we can um, we can understand how uh, ALP couplings um, enter this operator uh, through the running, and we can put a constraint on this sort of quadratic combination of ALP couplings uh, from this observable. And uh, another obvious place to look when, you know, trying to constrain uh, SMEFT operators is uh, Z-pore measurements of electroweak precision observables, because these are some of the strongest constraints that we have on the SMEFT. Um, and so uh, taking a extremely sort of crude approach to this, we can just pick a uh, marginalized bound on a single operator. Um, so you can take this from, from global fits. Um, and if you assume that the only contribution to this operator is through the ALP running. So, you know, for example, you're assuming that you start off with zero um, contact term interactions at the high scale, and we just allow the ALP to contribute through running, um, then this uh, can, be, can be phrased as a, uh, as a bound on the ALP coupling to um, SU2 gauge bosons. And in this way, um, from this marginalized bound, we can get a bound on CWW, which is competitive with diphoton constraints um, for ALPs in a certain mass range. Um, but of course, you know, taking a single marginalized bound is unlikely to be um, the best approach because, um, you know, as I showed on the previous slide, this, this same ALP coupling can contribute to several different observables, uh, several different dimension six operators, 
many of which will also produce effects uh, in, in uh, electroweak precision observables. And so really, I think a, a combined global fit should do much better and is really uh, the best way of doing this. So there's clearly a lot more to do. Um, and I think in general, like this kind of um, approach of, um, of adding new light degrees of freedom into a sort of effective field theory um, is a very interesting one because we have very few options uh, for a light neutral particle um, in terms of their quantum numbers. And so by including them in the EFT, we sort of understand the robustness of a SMEFT approach to, to, you know, to the presence of these light new particles, which we may not have detected. Um, and we can also um, start to get an idea of, of if, if this is, if sort of taking this indirect approach to constraining the ALP or the light new particle um, uh, couplings can, can tell you anything that direct searches can't. Okay, so um, that was a bit of an interlude into the world of dimension six, but now I'm going to come back to the dimension five ALP couplings and continue down through the scales. Um, and at the electroweak scale, we need to match onto an effective field theory which does not contain the heavier standard model particles. So, um, so what this involves at tree level is, um, you know, your your SU2 and U1 hypercharged cage bosons um, become phrased just in terms of, of the photons. And for the, um, for the fermions, instead of thinking about um, doublets and singlets under SU2, we can just think about left and right independently and um, rewrite the coupling matrices as these Ks um, in that language. And at loop level, there are no loop matching contributions to the gauge couplings for a light ALP because they, they are very suppressed by the ALP mass. But there are important uh, one loop matching contributions for fermionic couplings. Um, and some of these uh, induce uh, flavor changing effects as well. And uh, finally, um, going down through the scales, we just need to run below the electroweak scale. And the RG equations here are extremely simple um, because there are no, uh, there's no Higgs, so there's no Yukara interactions. Um, and so we just have, um, we, we, we just have contributions to the, um, all of the fermion couplings in a sort of flavor universal and diagonal way. And the gauge couplings don't run at all. Okay, so, um, Overall, one of the most important effects that you get from all of this running down that I've discussed so far is that you inevitably generate quarked flavor changing effects. Um, and these are especially large in um, left-handed down type quarks um, just because of the structure of the standard model. And so the way this happens, just to summarize this, is in, um, is via divergent diagrams like this one at the top in the middle with, um, with tops in the loop. And um, beyond one loop, um, this can be combined with divergent diagrams which, which produce top couplings from, uh, for example, um, gauge bosons like this. So, so these, these together produce um, RG effects which generate these from different couplings. Uh, down to the electroweak scale. And then at the electroweak scale, there are additional um, matching contributions. Uh, in particular, uh, this, um, this diagram with W boson couplings, um, this is finite, so it doesn't, it doesn't um, contribute to the RGs, but it does produce a matching contribution. And so overall, we end up with a flavor changing uh, uh, a flavor changing coupling to down type quarks uh, below the electroweak scale. And we can sort of take a look at what, um, what, kinds, of, what kinds of sizes of effects you get from this um, by, by looking at all of the couplings that are flavor conserving at the high scale and seeing what, what they give you um, at the electroweak scale. And that's, um, 
that's given in this equation here. And you can see that everything is proportional to VTI, VTJ, uh, just because um, that's, that's how it comes through in the standard model. And uh, the largest effects here are places where you started off with a coupling to tops. So left-handed uptype quarks, uh, sorry, right-handed uptype quarks and left-handed quark doublets. But we can, um, we can calculate the effects of any, um, of any initial coupling in this way. And you see that you still get effects from gluons, Ws, et cetera. So clearly we're going to have some flavor phenomenology for the ALP, which is going to be important. Um, but um, in order to understand the, the, the lightest flavor effects, so in particular K-on decays, uh, we need to match to, the, to a chiral Lagrangian. And that's the subject of the next few slides. So we've run down to the GUV scale. Um, in the quark sector, we only have UD and S quarks in the theory. And so we can rewrite the general Lagrangian in terms of a vector of these UD and S quarks um, here. And then we have couplings to left-handed quarks and couplings to right-handed quarks and um, couplings to gluons and photons. And we want to match this quark-level Lagrangian onto a chiral Lagrangian written in terms of the meson fields. Um, and the only handle that we really have um, in order to construct a chiral Lagrangian is uh, symmetries. And so um, in order to in order to categorize the symmetries of our quark level Lagrangian, we can do the mother of all spurion analyses. And, um, and we rewrite the Lagrangian uh, in terms of just the quarks, the gauge bosons, and everything else is spurion. So we have some you know, scalar and pseudoscalar currents of quarks. We have um, a left-handed quark current multiplied by this uh, L mu spurion, right-handed quark current multiplied by the R mu spurion, and then um, couplings to um, gluons and photons multiplied by these theta spurions. And now the whole Lagrangian has local chiral invariants under U3 left cross U3 right. As long as the background fields um, have particular transformation properties, which are defined here. Um, now, um, in the next step, um, it's convenient and conventional to rotate away the gluon coupling um, so that we no longer have uh, a, a GG dual term in the Lagrangian. And we can do this quite easily by doing a ALP dependent um, chiral rotation defined by these um, uh, defined by these rotation matrices. And you see that you've got the coupling in here and a kappa uh, matrix, which is a three by three matrix in quark flavor space. And any choice is going to work to eliminate the um, the gluon term, as long as the trace of this kappa is one. And once we do this uh, rotation, um, then there is no longer a ALP GG dual term in, in the Lagrangian, but we do rotate this CGG parameter into other terms in the Lagrangian. And then the final step um, is to break the symmetry by setting the spurions to their actual values. Um, as defined by our original Lagrangian and this, this rotation that we've just done. Um, and so this, the, the explicit values are, are given here for concreteness. And now, you know, we have a full understanding of the, um, of the symmetry structure of our quark level Lagrangian. And so we can now construct a chiral Lagrangian to mimic that out of the meson octet and the spurions. And so the meson, the meson octet is written in terms of this sigma field, um, as is usual for a chiral Lagrangian. 
And the first thing to do before constructing a Lagrangian is to construct a covariant derivative, which transforms covariantly under um, chiral uh, transformations. And in order to do this, we need to include these L and R spurions um, in the um, covariant derivative. And once we put in their um, concrete values, we end up with, with this as our covariant derivative. And uh, you notice that it contains, um, it contains terms involving the ALP. And then finally, we can write a Lagrangian um, in terms of this covariant derivative. Um, and we have a kinetic term, a mass term for the mesons, whose um, coefficient is fixed empirically by the pion mass, and then terms, uh, the kinetic and mass term for the ALP and the coupling between the ALP and the photons. And the terms in the first line, once you expand them out, are going to contain uh, mass and kinetic mixing between the ALP and the neutral mesons. And now, you know, one of the things that we're aiming for in doing this is to understand um, K on decays. And so in order to do that, we need also to include the weak interactions um, since they mediate K on decays. And the leading um, term in the, uh, in the chiral Lagrangian that does this um, is a SU3 left octet operator constructed out of um, left-handed currents. And this left-handed current L mu is the sort of chiral version of, um, of the left-handed quark current. You know, we know that the weak interactions are coupled to that. And we also know that this, um, this left-handed quark, quark current is the thing that couples to the spurion L mu. And so we simply need to look in our chiral Lagrangian for the thing that couples to this spurion. Um, and it turns out that um, that, that is given by this. Um, and so, again, um, the form of this, um, you know, isn't, uh, isn't something that you need to pay too much attention to, apart from the fact that, you know, it again has the ALP in it, and in particular it has a piece from the ALP term in the covariant derivative. So now we've constructed our whole Lagrangian, and we can now calculate important observables in particular, k to pi a. And, um, and k to pi a, uh, you know, you can draw Feynman diagrams from, from, the, um, from the Lagrangian that we have. And there are sort of two kinds of ways that, um, that this can be generated from this Lagrangian. One is uh, that the flavor change happens through the weak interaction. So a sort of S U U D uh, transition. And then there's also a term where it can come from an explicit flavor changing ALP coupling, so an ALP coupling to a strange and a down. Um, but because, you know, because this is only part of the, um, of the contribution, we can actually obtain bounds on an ALP which is coupling only flavor universally and flavor conservingly at the low scale. And if we take the Na62 um, bound on B to K pi plus, you know, an invisible um, an invisible particle, uh, we we get a constraint of about 60 TeV on the gluon and quark couplings. But um, from you know from all of this running and matching calculation, we know that that an ALP which has uh, flavor completely flavor conserving interactions at the low scale is actually quite hard to construct because even if you start off with flavor conserving couplings at the high scale lambda, you're going to generate them um, by the time you've, you've reached the scale of the flavor measurements. Um, so on this slide, I just want to talk about what happens if you start from the high scale now. So, um, so we're starting at four pi TeV, and again we can we can take each of these sort of high scale couplings and trace through how they contribute to the k to pi a um, amplitude um, by separating out into these two um, 
into these two ways. One where you've generated an explicit ALK flavor changing interaction, and one where the flavor change happens through the weak STUUD interaction. And these two types have different um, CKM dependence uh, because from running and matching, you get a VTS, VTD, whereas from the um, from the weak interactions at the low scale, you get VUS, VUD. Um, and all I want to point out here is just that even if you start off with flavor conserving couplings at lambda, and even though you have this way that flavor conserving couplings at the low scale uh, can still produce this effect, the largest effects you get are often from running and matching, producing flavor changing couplings at the low scale. And you can see this particularly if you look at the contribution from C CWW, so from the out coupling to uh, W bosons, uh, the largest effect that you get um, is, is through um, a direct out flavor changing coupling. And another thing that we can look at is the, um, is the difference between the charged and the neutral modes, because, um, because the form of the amplitudes is rather different. So for K long to pi naught um, alp, this is a CP violating decay. So we need to have some um, mechanism for CP violation. And if you're producing, um, if, you, if you're producing the effects through this sort of teal box, through the explicitly um, flavor changing interactions at the low scale, then because it's proportional to VTS, VTD, you can get a CP violating part from the imaginary part of VTS, VTD, which as it happens is of the same order of magnitude as the magnitude of VTS, VTD. Whereas uh, for the piece that um, goes through the STUUD process, uh, that's proportional to VUS, VUD, which is real. So instead here, the CP violation has to come from uh, the epsilon parameter, which, which uh, measures uh, CP violation in K on mixing. So here, there's a, there's a large suppression. And so what this means is that if any particular ALP coupling um, produces most of its effects through running and matching, then there isn't going to be a huge difference in, in the effect that you see in charged K on decays versus neutral K on decays. Uh, versus K long, I mean. But if instead uh, you're relying on this uh, VUS VUD uh, dependent piece, then you're going to get a serious suppression um, when you look at the K long decays. Um, and so we can think about what this looks like in experiment. Um, so if we're producing a light alp through a K to pi A decay, then there are two options. Either it escapes the detector um, and produces a missing energy signature, or it decays uh, sufficiently promptly to show up in a final state such as k to pi gamma gamma. Um, and so if we now think about a simplified scenario with only one coupling at the high scale, um, we can look at the bounds that you get from these different processes. Um, so uh, on the left, we've got a coupling to SU2 gauge bosons, and on the right, we've got a coupling to gluons. And, um, and the colored regions are the bounds on this parameter space uh, from, from these different K on decay experiments. And so one thing that you notice is that on the left for, for CWW, there is not a huge hierarchy between the K long bound and the K plus bound. And uh, this basically comes down to the fact that, you know, the, the ratio of the amplitudes um, is only proportional to the ratio of the imaginary part um, to the absolute value of VTS, VTD, which is not, not a large hierarchy. Whereas for the gluons, um, the, the K long is far less sensitive than the K plus, and that's because of this uh, epsilon suppression um, that I mentioned before. Um, and so in general, this can actually give you a, a degree of model discrimination. If we, you know, if we suddenly start to see a signal in, um, in K on decays, uh, then we can look 
at the corresponding signal uh, in the in the other mode, charged or neutral, uh, in order to see what kind of couplings uh, this could um, this could have come from. Okay, so um, that was all about kaons, but of course uh, there are other flavor observables that are available. Um, and uh, so here is just a a plot showing all, all of all of the flavor bounds on a simplified scenario where uh, we only have couplings to SU2 gauge bosons at the high scale. And um, yeah, and so you see that for low out masses, the, the K on decays uh, involving missing energy are very important. Uh, but for higher out masses, the, the decay mode uh, to two muons opens up. And here searches for um, B to K ALP uh, with the ALP decaying into two muons uh, are quite constraining. And if we are looking at this parameter space where we're, we're just picking a uh, coupling at the high scale and calculating its effects going down, then another thing that we can do is we can compare flavor constraints with uh, phenomenology at other scales. Uh, so this is illustrated in this uh, little plot on the right. And the, um, the gray regions are just the, the, the flavor bounds from the left-hand side copied over. And over the top, uh, we've got um, in this sort of pale pink region is the region that's ruled out by the Z width because this same coupling will produce a Z decay to an ALP and a photon. And we've also got lines of constant branching ratio for the Higgs decaying into, into two Alps through the same coupling. Um, and uh, we can even take this a step further uh, by noticing that, um, that you know, at low energies, this um, SU2 coupling translates to a photon coupling. Um, and the photon coupling of the Alp um, is, is something that is often searched for and, and used to constrain um, uh, an, an ALP model. Uh, and so this is shown on, in the plot on the left. Uh, we have all of the bounds on the ALP photon coupling uh, as, a, as a wide range of masses. And so for, for lower masses, we've got uh, very strong constraints from uh, astrophysics. And uh, then for higher, higher masses, um, constraints from colliders become important. And so on the right, um, under this assumption that we start off just with a CWW coupling, uh, we can superimpose these same, um, these same photon bounds uh, taken between the two dashed lines, um, which, which is shown in gray. And underneath in color are the flavor bounds from the previous slide. Um, so you see that under this assumption, the, the sort of the, the flavor effects that you get from the separation of scales uh, can allow you to fill in uh, some regions of parameter space in this plot. Um, of course, there are other assumptions that you can start off with um, in order to get a sort of simplified scenario at the high scale. Um, and in this, on this slide, uh, we're assuming a coupling only to right-handed uptype quarks um, in a flavor universal and diagonal way. Um, and this again produces a flavor changing effect through this kind of diagram. And so many of the regions uh, that exclude um, parts of this parameter space are the same as on the previous slide. I mean, all the same, all the same observables are there. Uh, they've just sort of shifted around a bit for this new scenario. Um, but again, we've got uh, K on decays at low energies and, um, and uh, B decays at higher energies. And we've also on this plot got uh, the constraint from the chromomagnetic moment of the top, uh, which uh, I talked about earlier, uh, which is, um, you know, peaking out there. <clears throat> And, um, and again, on the right-hand side, we can think about 
uh, interplay with Z and Higgs phenomenology. So we've got um, uh, lines of constant branching ratio for the Higgs to, to decay into two Alps and into uh, a Z and an Alp. And finally, uh, just to show one more example of a sort of two-dimensional parameter space that you can constrain. Uh, if we think about the coupling to right-handed down-type quarks, now at one loop, um, there is no diagram that you can start off with a coupling to right-handed down-type quarks in a flavor conserving way, and you end up with a coupling that is flavor changing. So the flavor changing effects in this scenario are suppressed relative to the previous two scenarios I showed. But still you can get strong constraints from k on decays um, because you can go through, um, through the weak interactions in the chiral Lagrangian um, and sort of just <clears throat> mix with the with the kaons and the pions through this um, uh, through this coupling basically. And so this is still a strong constraint. Whereas at higher um, masses, the most important constraints um, are from uh, epsilon decays. Uh, because this can happen at tree level through this coupling, um, through the coupling to bees. And then the ALP can again decay at tree level to hadrons, and this gives you um, a reasonably sensitive constraint from this observable. Okay, so uh, that brings me to my summary. Um, Axion-like particles are a generic option for light U physics, um, and they are very easily studied in terms of EFTs. Um, but within an EFT, uh, you can get uh, important effects from running and matching, which can give you new phenomenology, including flavor phenomenology. And you can also affect uh, dimension six map-like operators um, at different scales. And so meson decays provide very important constraints on axion-like particles, uh, no matter basically no matter what um, couplings you start off with. Uh, and they, in this way, they can provide some of the strongest constraints on ALPs in the MEV to GEV mass range. So if you have an ALP in this range, then flavor is a very good place to look for it. Thank you.